Hello. Hello. Hi, Tony. Hello, Sai, Sai Ram. Hi, Matteo. Matteo, he looks like he's all in the dark <laughs> with the light. <laughs> <laughs> this is commitment. Who is a uh, username Sairam? Would you like to say hello? Well, perhaps they will actively listen. There's John. Do you want to wait still a few more minutes, uh, Marco? <clears throat> We can get started. Okay. It's a couple minutes after. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm running this show today. Um, well, and Marco. <laughs> One uh, <third> or so. <laughs> so I took on the responsibility for chapters 17 and 18, and Marco is going to do 19. Um, I feel like I, I got the 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 cherry on the Sunday because these two chapters are extraordinary. And so um, uh, it was a wonderful exercise to go through to do this. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start, uh, so I'll, I'll do it, we'll do a three minute meditation, but I have a quotation from Savitri to begin with. Um, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to read it. No, I think I'm going to do a minute of meditation, then read it, and then we'll do um, a, a few more minutes of meditation. Okay? Is that good? And then I yes. thought we'll do 40 minutes for the first. I'll, I'll do like Tony did. I'll run through the first one. We'll do some discussion for 40 minutes. I'll do the second one, we'll do the discussion 40 minutes, and that will leave 30 minutes for Marco to do the third section at the end. Okay?
Then Savitri's heart fell mute. It spoke no word. But holding back her troubled rebel heart, abrupt, erect, and strong, calm like a hill, surmounting the seas of mortal ignorance, its peak immutable above mind's air, a power within answered her still uh, answered the still voice. I am thy portion here charged with thy work, as thou myself seated forever above, speak to my depths, O great and deathless voice. Command, for I am here to do thy will. The voice replied, Remember why thou camest, find out thy soul, recover thy hid self. In silence seek God's meaning in thy depths, then mortal nature change to the divine. So chapter 17 is called The Progress to Knowledge, God, Man, and Nature. And what, I do, what I'm going to do is I, my notes are all tagged to each paragraph, and they're numbered. So I know Matteo likes to keep track of the paragraphs. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'll try to remember to say the numbers, but um, I might skip over a couple of them. Um, that was so, a lovely reading of Savitri. Yes, it was Thank fun you. because it, 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 it's so pertinent to the context of the, of the two chapters. So, um, so, num so, so paragraph one, the starting point is an involution from which emerges a state of what I call vibration, which leans towards self-finding uh, that is a kind of propagation. Um, so you'll hear the physicist talking through me. <laughs> Some of the terms are physics. <laughs> Aurobindo notes that to attain knowledge, one must first be of necessity be ignorant. He also highlights the idea that this vibrational state leaning towards the infinite is by its nature both emergent and integral. Two. The goal of humankind is to self-affirm, then evolve, then exceed the self, that is, 
achieve a transformation for your self-enlargement that is a kind of self-referential bootstrapping, there's the physics again, uh, which forms a turning point in the evolutionary process. The human must overcome the constraints of embodiment and limited mentality to become a kind of master of the self, the environment, and the universal nature of being. Three, the knowledge to be achieved is not intellectual in nature, but rather spiritual, that is, belonging to the domain of the numinous. We must, quote, grow into our true being, unquote. Four, we begin by understanding ourselves in very limited ways, that is, as an ego-figuring self. To grow into our true being, therefore, we must exceed ourselves, which Aurobindo describes as a difficult and dangerous necessity. Five, we naturally turn to our abilities for manipulating intellectual knowledge or practical action to achieve this goal, but these abilities will fail us. Instead, we need to heighten our awareness of our own complexity within an impulsion towards a greater breadth of being, that is, a being focused towards universality and the infinite. Six, to move in this way, humans need to accept that progress will be incremental and clouded in uncertainty to begin with. Their first steps will be from the position of a being which views itself as isolated and yet inseparable from all others, that is, aware as an individual of the central paradox of being separate, yet bound. Following this, they will develop an awareness that this central paradox is shared by all living beings and therefore is a universal experience of nature. From this, there emerges a third kind of awareness of a kind of spirit of striving which permeates the universe. Seven. This third awareness is, uh, is often called God, is what is often called God, and expresses both the striving towards something and the something towards which things strive. Furthermore, having admitted this third type of awareness, the urge to unify the three types of awareness develops, whether this is done by merging them or suppressing one or more of the terms such as accepting only the individual or only God or the predominance of nature over the, the individual and so forth. Eight, however, no one term can do the job. The individual is insufficient and cannot explain the nature of the cosmos. The visible cosmos also is insufficient since it does not contain the hidden elements of the individual or the world of nature, everything would be surface in that kind of universe. Furthermore, the notion of one or oneness cannot be arrived at by neglecting one term for another. The three terms taken together, however, lead to the idea of an infinite which contains all the finites. And this idea of the infinite leads inevitably to the idea of an absolute, this absolute must then be the divine. Nine, but the idea of the absolute cannot be used to replace the other terms, for to allow it to do so would remove the central paradox of existence. Meaning, according to Aurobindo, requires the three terms to remain active, the self in its own paradoxes, nature in its paradoxes, and God or the absolute. 10. The coming together of these three types of awareness or knowledge is what he calls integral, and this integral knowledge is part of what the evolving individual must gain access to in order to exceed the self. 11. This does not mean that the divine is dependent on the individual or the cosmos for existence, although the opposite remains true individual and the cosmos depend on the divine. The human indeed, any creature, as is, quote, an individual being of the divine. 
the divine manifests in each individual existence. Access to this knowledge requires either self-reflection or the study of the cosmos, but better still, both. Each mode carries its dangers. Through the self, one may become too absorbed. Through the cosmos, one may lose oneself in the impersonal. Access via the double way of self and cosmos results in exceeding both and hence achieving a state of divine being. 12. However, access to the divine in this way requires the individual to pass through many preparatory phases. First, an egoistic phase in which the individual is viewed as more important than others. Note that this is a necessary stage. It serves to help the individual find the beginnings of their path, as well as their own recognition of the sources of their power and, and enjoyment in life. This is what is needed to turn later towards larger and more divine goals. 13. To emerge from this grounding in ignorance, two forces must be engaged. First, the individual must become aware of the secret cosmic consciousness which draws him or her forward. This is achieved largely through groups of individuals, for the cosmic impulsion finds root in group interactions, a kind of collective consciousness. Note, however, that the collective conscious of the masses is not an ideal place for this to occur. Consciousness there is only slight, slightly separated from the subconscious. Unless there are powerful and enlightened individuals who can channel and express the energy absorbed there, stored there. This latter process, of course, has its perils, as tyrants can also use similar mechanisms to do great harm. 14. To steward the development of the secret cosmic consciousness found in groups, the individual who is grounded in his or her own freedom and separate power acquired from the egoistic stage is necessary. He or she needs to harness their creativity, their power for making things, and their ability to discern truths. They need to stand apart from the group to affirm their separate reality, otherwise they risk succumbing to the mass consciousness. 15. Although recognizing the individual's separate power is critically important, it is not enough to carry him or her forward to the next phase of development. It is necessary to look beyond the egoistic nature. This requires, first of all, self-analysis, focusing first of all on the working of the natural elements and his or her egoistic goals. Eventually, however, to to, however, to realize that these provide an insufficient explanation. This will lead to a succession of partial explanations as she and or he proceeds. 16. Note that through this process of self-extension, the focus remains knowledge of the self, even though elements of altruism and service to others may also be present. However, there is still a wider self a deeper secret self to be discovered. Quote, the spiritual and eternal individual, the Purusha. 17. The next stage of development is of necessity associated with the individual. Collectives are, after all, made up of individuals. Furthermore, to get beyond the ego is necessary, but one cannot get beyond the self except in the sense of a universal self. Paradoxically, to step beyond the ego requires one to offer up the self to the divine. Note, it is the self that is offered, not the ego. The formless and limited individual escapes into its own infinities. Aurobindo says, it is the, quote, it is the Brahman in the individual that effectuates this stupendous merger or this marvelous joining, yoga, of its eternal unit of being with its all-comprehending or supreme, all-transcending 
unity of eternal existence, unquote, which implies that this passage is not an act of will, but something that arises through other means when the preparatory work has been done. 18. This new phase asserts itself once the individual has abandoned their preoccupation with the relationship between nature, God, and the self, and thereby has become aware of the existence of states beyond the material. This is a major step away from what Aurobindo calls temporal ignorance, an enlargement of being that embraces the eternal. A second step involves recognition of just how much was heretofore hidden of the larger self, while a third step concerns the realization that there exists an immutable self and spirit over and above the evolving individual soul. These realizations will in turn transform the individual's perspective and change the actions that flow from these. 19 and 20 combined. At this point, the individual will observe that the self, the cosmos, and God have merged into an overarching unity, a one self. Furthermore, this overarching unity is also the one cosmos, which is itself awakening to consciousness. 21. The quest for God is now seen in retrospect to be the, quote, the most ardent and enthralling of quests, unquote. That process which began with a vague sense of something unseen in both nature and the self. Even in the context of the collective, these first stumblings may involve animism, spirit worship, even demon worship, uh, what Gebser calls the magical, before they progress towards a recognition of greater knowledge. 22. Indeed, behind the full range of contemporary religions and philosophies with its great diversity and discord, there is a common unity, albeit one characterized by many dimensions. There is only one divine infinite. Each particular religion approaches this in its own way. And the last one, 23. The Brahman, this common divine infinite, will be reached when the human's nature knowledge combines with the God knowledge. The cycles of the world are expressions of this absolute. It cannot be achieved by negating them. Full knowledge is triune, integrating self-knowledge, knowledge of nature and the cosmos, and knowledge of God. So the discussion is open. Getting the Jerry on the Sunday. I never heard that. <laughs> uh, well, you put it down in your list of English expressions. <laughs> um. Wow, that, that was long. Um, so, um, would you say that he um, actually sees a uh, kind of, um, you know, Brahma and God? It's actually all the same, right? So, for him, I mean, um, it's actually one process, or like if you look into other cultures, other traditions, it's all one. It's very much, I mean, it's the same, it's the same, the same process for him, right? So at the end, I think he said something on page 85, it's all the same, right? Yeah, well, I kind of think, because uh, I, I had some thoughts about this in relation to what this another, the, another friend on the site is doing. Um, it, it's all the same, but it's like, like, like he, there's this idea that the divine is in every individual. Actually, that's, anyway, it, it, it's like the Quaker idea of the divine. Or, or it's in the Bible, God is in everyone or something like that anyway. 
Um, but but it's also so it's like if if God is in every individual and there is only one divine being then you could see that as almost a multi-dimensional thing. It's the same being, but it's in many different dimensions. And you could do the same with the religions. Although all the different religions have their own approach to the divine being, since they're all dealing with the same thing, in a way it's like looking at it as different dimensions of the same thing. So it's the... And anti-ism, right? Anti... Panentheism. Yes, panentheism. Mm -hmm. And okay. yes, I think there are even in Hinduism different strands, like the uh, Sankhya philosophy, which he mentions, that uh, would recognize the plural plurality of beings. And um, it's still one thing, but there's a plur plurality of expressions, at least in different schools of let's say, Hinduism. Because I noticed at one point he talked about um, um, the idea of having many lives. Uh, you know, so th that, that's clearly outside the Christian tradition. It's more in the Hindu or the, even the Buddhist tradition. So, um, uh, but I, he, he doesn't really commit to it. He just sort of says it's part of one of the variations of the understanding of what's going on, right? So, I think uh, reincarnation was part of the um, Christian, let's say, worldview until the fifth century. And then they said, no, basically, if a lot of um, bishops came together and voted on it, and they voted reincarnation out of the pantheon of uh, Christian doctrines, but it's not, it's, not, um, uh, it's not that people hadn't had these ideas in um, the West. I didn't know that. That's interesting. I don't know, Matteo, if you have an idea whether Aurobindo is committed to the idea of reincarnation or whether it's peripheral to his way of thinking. I know that he touches on it in the next chapter of Philosophy and Rebirth. Hmm. Um, but to, uh, I guess, to commit to that question, the, the answer is yes. In, in the sense that the, the, the psychic being, the Chaitya Purusha, is eternal and individual. And even though we don't have, often have memories of past lives, it seems like there, there is some knowing that, that, uh, that we have, that, this, that the soul that, that we're moving around with has occupied other forms. And I, I would, uh, on the point of saying that it, it's all one and that it's all the same, it, it's, like, it's like, yes, if we can hold that with the truth of the multiplicity, like Jeffrey was saying, you, you put it much better, Jeffrey, but that was, uh, um, yeah, that was a nice answer. <clears throat> What struck me in I thought he had a very interesting uh, reflection on the um, kind of mass mass consciousness and kind of this working of this relationship of a highly developed um, you know individual person and uh, the mass consciousness and that the mass consciousness is almost by necessity unconscious so um, you know, there are ideas nowadays of 
something like a swarm intelligence. I'm not, I'm not sure if that works, but um, I found this very interesting, this uh, idea of um, the mass consciousness being um, you know, almost by necessity lower or um, undeveloped or unconscious even. I was speaking with Jeffrey the other day and it was a different conversation, but we dovetailed into this and this issue in particular. Um, because the same or similar idea you find in Heidegger and which I don't think, you know, Aurobindo was drawing on, but also in Nietzsche, the idea of the, the herd mentality or the, the mass consciousness. Um, what, what's, which, which relates to what I was, uh, you know, what was coming up for me in response to the, the summary and, and revisiting the chapter, which is that uh, the way that Aurobindo like divides up knowledge, like the three main domains of knowledge, God, man, cosmos. Uh, I like, I noticed that um, in the postmodern world, in our contemporary world, we have a greater sensibility for the social. Uh, I think that in this division. The social is kind of part of the cosmos. It's kind of not self. Uh, it's part of the, you know, the world of phenomena of crowds, other people. Uh, all of that is part of manifestation. Uh, and the individual is a separate principle uh, that I think in Aurobindo's construction of it here, um, you know, has this, uh, this very clean distinctness that I think probably like in, in like in current times we would find a lot messier, a lot, a lot more entangled uh, with, you know, with the social and with, you know, all of the other uh, ways in which the cosmic or the natural, the earth, um, psych our, our, our biology, our psychology affects who we are as individuals. Now, that's like the surface part of, part of the self, but even that, I think, is not as clean cut as uh, as is expressed here. At the same time, I I felt um, almost uh, reassured or refreshed by the um, the clarity of that division of things and the the importance that he places on that individual real affirmation, but then breaking through affirmation into the recognition of a universality or um, a cosmic consciousness. So, um, I thought it was a wonderful chapter too. It was exhilarating to, to read, uh, and partly because I think he makes the case so powerfully that uh, that this experience of radical individuality of a psychic being is fundamental and that the experience of a manifest universe is fundamental and that the experience of the transcendent and the, the infinite is, is fundamental. And they, they, they all arise together um, or rather not arise together because they are different. The, the infinite, he says, is prior to it does not depend on the others, but the others depend on it. And so there's that like ontological priority or that, that absolutism as we were discussing the other day, uh, Jeffrey. And well, I thought this was like almost the, the crowning kind of expression of the, his integral knowledge of his conception of integral knowledge. And then, you know, the later chapters go into something more about how it unfolds, which we'll come to. I think by reading this, you really get some appetite to do some spiritual practice. No? Reading this, I just want to 
go out and meditate or do yoga or something like this. Um, Marco, what you said, I think, uh, so there are those uh, domains, the physical, the mental, the vital, and um, they are separated and they come together almost by necessity. And he's very uh, kind of um, sure, very confident about this. They come almost together by necessity in uh, what he calls the absolute, in a higher, in a higher union. And um, that's where the uh, separation, at least for him, kind of um, goes away. I mean, the, the world of form, the world of um, the world of personal experience, you know, it's all in a, united in a greater oneness for him. So it's interesting. And he really um, talks you up to that place somehow. Um, I also found it very interesting that he really seems to recognize uh, that it is a development. So he goes um, in some earlier pages, he goes through um, this development of uh, a person and um, his or her um, you know, perspective over a, a lifetime. And he clearly says that, I mean, you have to be, uh, you know, you have to be a child before you can do this higher, um, more adult form of um, you know, recognizing, uh, recognizing the world as a total whole. So you do have to, you do have, to, it, it is a progression and you do have to develop yourself there. You, you can't just um, start there. So you start at, at the bottom, you start at the physical, you start um, engaging with um, your body, and then you work yourself up. I'd like how he described matter, the material plane. That Marco, can point. you maybe talk a little bit louder? I, oh. can I said that I, I like how he described matter, the material plane, the starting point for that progression. Um, calls it a luminous, uh, the dark sphinx of the unconscious below and from within and by above, uh, you know, what, what must one go through? I think, you know, what must one um, kind of enter into? Like one has to enter into the ignorance, like uh, to the depths of the, the unknown of that, of that mystery of the, you know, the vast material realm to even begin this journey, I think that that, that was, um, uh, for me, I'm, it's kind of moving, like a kind of poetic when, when he gives these images for, for, for what, what in a way justifies this whole journey. Uh, and the, the, not only, I mean, af, after the going into the ignorance, but the affirmation of the separateness also being, um, an important part because like you say, Tony, it's part of the building blocks uh, for that higher synthesis or that, that greater integration of the, of the, dif of the different kinds of knowledge. Mm. Well, this, the separateness is part of, um, so I think somewhere he says that the separateness actually, actually is um, not there. I mean, people, are not really separate. Um, it's just mm, one occasion of something happening, but it does happen in some kind of larger context. Yet there, there's a necessity to play it out, right? Like we, we have to, part of what he's saying, which I think is um, kind of giving a place to an experience that we have being you know, alive beings in a world of conflict, a world of, uh, of um, you know, that, that's dangerous, it's fraught with, with difficulty, is that there's something of necessity in that 
in that phase at least in that stage uh, at least and um this way that you know all these separate or apparently separate or agents uh express themselves affirm their separateness like claim a piece of reality for themselves uh against you know others and against the whole um I mean, it's it's such it's an incredibly painful uh, uh, dimension to exist in, but he sees it as a turning point also because through that engagement, you know, with the ignorance, through that engagement with the inconscient, and then he goes into the other, the the circumconscient, the intraconscient, all these different um, aspects. Uh, that, that's I think the thing about Aurobindo is that he promises something on the other side. Uh, and that's that's the uh, you know, this is all going somewhere. It's all leading to a, a grander integration, a, a transformation of the ignorance into into a knowledge. And um, I, mean, I think I think that that's a fantastic project. I think that that's I mean that's I think that's the thing to do. Um, in my experience, it's not as easy as it sounds. I think here as as kind of already accomplished as it uh as he seems to describe it um it feels a lot messier to me i drew a little picture um can you see this yes okay these are the um birds going flying in different directions they're all individuals doing their own thing. But they can't travel very far. They stay pretty local. But if they want to go long distance, they have to formation, they have to create a formation, a flock moving in a direction. And they can travel for huge distances, thousands of miles, which is kind of miraculous. And you know, the, the bird who may be in the center may not be the strongest bird. There's something about the group dynamic that allows uh, these creatures to organize uh, their behavior in ways that allow them to pick up patterns in their environment that they wouldn't have been able to do by themselves. So they can, we, we don't know much about this, but we know they can, um, they have a relationship to gravity and a sensitivity to light. And they have some sort of way of navigating these great distances. Probably a lot of it is uh, an intergenerational memory as well. Um, it's not possible, I think, that one generation could come up with this kind of, uh, this kind of social organization that would allow them to make these gigantic migrations in, in a landscape that's uh, shifting constantly. So... I, I, that's a very helpful uh, sort of way of me for me thinking about this. Um, what I think Orbindo was up against, because I I think he's saying that the uh, unlike you know it, I think he's he's working with the ego, not a lot a lot you know annihilating the ego but refining it so that it can become a way of orienting, finding direction um, by in these sort of rhythms, these complex uh, noisy systems that humans are in, how do you find pattern? How do you detect pattern? How, uh, you know, there's, you, you chop onions, you toss in the skillet, chop onions, toss it in a skillet, chop onions, toss in a skillet. That becomes a pattern, but it's just a, something that's just very re, uh, regimented. But then you have other kinds of patterns, which, which, are, which are much more complex, where there's a kind of uh, folding in so that you um, have to go to a, another level to observe behaviors, it's a kind of meta level. And... Um, that's a different, those are different kinds of rhythms. And I think those tempo rhythms can become in humans extremely um, 
extremely unique. I mean, they are unique. And each of us has um, a way of making sense and, um, and working with the ego. Um, I think it's, I think he was very attuned to this and it's hard. And I think you can't read him without reading other, the books that he was reading and most influenced by. Um, I'm, I'm very aware that he was really absorbed in the, the Veda and, and the Bhagavad Gita. And he, he made commentaries, which I've not read yet on the Bhagavad Gita, but I can see, I can sense that that's the background that he's drawing upon here. As you recall that, that great battlefield poem with the, was it Nagarjuna, not Nagarjuna, Arjuna and... Kurukshetra with Arjuna and Krishna. Krishna, yes, in that great um, dialogue, he doesn't want to be a part of this battle because he's going to have to kill um, members of his family, people that he loves. And um, so he just wants to, you know, forget about, forget it, throw down his weapons. But he's advised not to do that by, by um, this higher intelligence that he is in relationship with. So I think those kinds of struggles you, hear, you sense in the Bhagavad Gita are really about uh, the refinement of the ego. It's not about annihilating ego, which I think maybe early, earlier um, institutions sort of, um, you know, those priestly um, kinds of institutions where you have a, have a priest or priestess or the avatar who makes the, the decisions for the group. I think that um, the Bhagavad Gita is sort of um, breaking out of that mold. And I think you can hear that in his, um, in I think these these chapters. Um, it's, it seems to me like he's got all the characters, including God. He's brought them all out on stage. It's like all the principal singers are there on stage. You hear the orchestra playing and you don't know, and you can sort of sense where this is going. I think it has a, definitely has a, sense of direction um but i'm just bringing this up because um i think it's a it's it's very personal it's a personal kind of experience to read this because i'm sure all of you guys have had this experience of oscillating back and forth um you, you know should i take this job should i quit this job should i have a relationship with this person should i should i you know not speak to my family after some egregious error they've made how do i negotiate this, um, sometimes very unique circumstances where there's no manual that I can go to and get the answer. I have to sort of drop what I think I know and go inside and um, pay exquisite attention. Um, and I think it's a very rhythmic, affective kind of attunement uh, rather than some sort of cerebral pre-given formula. Um, and I think in our tr in our world, this is it's getting extremely messy. So I believe it's a it's a it's a frustrating reading Arbindo because he seems to have worked it out so well. Because um, my 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 world is much messier, I think, than his. <laughs> the ashram where he can sort of sit and meditate all day. Um, but he doesn't seem to be, but he does, I, I think I mentioned last time, I think I made an error. I listened to our, our conversation last time. Um, and I, 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 I kept talking about the post-spiritual that I thought he was representing, and him other representing, I meant the post-religious spirituality, which I think he was beginning to embody in his relationship with the mother, because they were very eccentric, sort of a, a initiatic tantric couple, to say the least. <clears throat> they seemed to be very uh, mentally attuned to one another. And, um, I, and I believe that in a way he was the last avatar. And I think he was saying farewell in a way to a certain style of doing religion. And, um, because I see a little point in trying to replicate this, but but I but I do find a great value in that affective attunement to the great body of literature that he was drawing upon and the innovations that he was making, because I think he has a great interest in novelty and pattern, and he who 
he or she who detects a new pattern is bifurcating the cosmos. <laughs> I think he's I think he's very attuned to this as an immense value that uh, each of us can brings bring that to the to the cosmos. Um, so it continues to baffle me and frustrate me and and sort of and sometimes very charming. I think he has a sort of charming quality. Um, and uh, there's a little bit of the urbane sophisticate in him on occasion. I get a very cosmopolitan kind of guy who can you know, take in the whole geopolitical. This is another of his writings, not in this one. So I'm just talking about my sort of raw gut feels here um, that I think he's, um, he, he continues to challenge me and interest me and bores me a little bit. I mean, I find myself like in, but then I think great books often bore me. I mean, there's stretches of Moby Dick are just intolerable. <laughs> I learned more about Wells than I ever wanted to know. And I think sometimes this, this, uh, Orbindo does the same thing. I think he, he just, um, but it's good that he's not, he's letting it all hang out. He just keeps on going because it has the kind of wave like oceanic kind of quality. Because when he, when he does find the find the climax, it's quite splendid. So I get I get the feeling that we're moving towards something quite climactic. So, thank you. Thanks, Johnny. I'm gonna. I'm sorry. I'm gonna step in here. I think we need to move on to the next segment. Uh, in a way, your comments about pattern are particularly relevant because that's in the way what the next chapter deals with. So. Um, so I'm sorry if it's a bit long, Tony, you said it was kind of long. I had the time to summarize everything, but not to compress it. So, <laughs> so you'll just have to <laughs> bear with it. For <laughs> There's so much there in this text, so, so vast. Yes. And, and I kind of indulge myself in things that I, I like, so I, I don't necessarily, I could have done more compression, but when I looked at stuff, I thought, well, I kind of like this, so I'm going to keep it. So. <laughs> Chapter 18, the evolutionary process, ascent and integration. So in a way, the first, the chapter uh, 17 was about the progression of the individual. And chapter 18 is about the progression of humanity or of the universe in a way, including humanity and the individual. So um, one Aurobindo now turns his attention from the progression of the self to the evolution of what he calls earth nature. Just as in the previous chapter, he seeks to elucidate, elucidate this evolution from a predominantly mental status of ignorance to what, towards what he calls supermental consciousness and integral knowledge. The latter we have just seen described as triune knowledge. The natural world is governed by the application of constant laws to highly variable contexts. He notes that the evolutionary process shares with the developmental progress that it begins in material inconscience and will build towards spirit. Therefore, it must also lead to an integrated triune state of being. Furthermore, Aurobindo notes that a complex organization of consciousness must also be involved. Two, the result of what he calls his, this triple process must involve a transformation from ignorance to the triune knowledge. That is, if in the early stages the process involves the inconscience, the emergence of partial consciousness will be accompanied by the recognition of ignorance. And furthermore, at some point, the principle of knowledge must be actualized in full consciousness. Hence, the process involves three stages, the inconscience, which provides an involutionary foundation, ignorance associated with a series of emerging powers, and finally, the supreme manifestation in full knowledge. Three, Aurobindo then refers to the principle of, of involution to address what I call issues of novelty and power. He notes that in an evolutionary process, that an evolutionary process necessarily implies that things change, not just the entities themselves, but also the laws that govern those entities. In order for the new laws to have power, as opposed to being merely derivative, 
he suggests that they must incorporate divine properties, hence the need for a, an involution principle in order to have access to these. In the early, for in the early stages of the evolution, matter is inconscient. There, we are therefore talking about the material universe. Life and mind must use matter in their, as their substance. For example, changing its inertia, immobility, and inconscience into movement, feeling, consciousness, and life. They cannot, however, make matter something it is not, altogether alive or altogether conscious. Hence, life in matter is bound by death, and mind in matter is bound by ignorance and driven by the physical and life processes of the body. Aurobindo concludes that these constraints imply that neither mind nor life are aspects of the original power. He then seeks to further elucidate the nature of this source power. It cannot be matter because matter is not conscious. And therefore, since neither life nor mind can be the source, there must be another secret consciousness, which is also more essential than matter. This source power he calls supramental because it must be greater than both mind and life, and he associates this power with the spirit. For evolution to take place, the supermind must have entered into matter and evolved with it. Six, this evolution is, therefore, a kind of progressive manifestation of spirit within the material universe. At each stage, the impulsion that carries it forward results from the combination of the material organization and the state of consciousness it has achieved. The movement forward is resisted by the inconscience. Seven, each step forward is more a continuous change of state. There are no phases with, dis with distinct separations. This movement passes from material forms the emergence of living beings, and then mental beings. Eventually, a supermind must also establish itself. Humanity itself is the fulcrum for this movement because in the process of the universe becoming aware of itself, the human represents the first group that clearly becomes self-aware. More on this later. Eight, the first stage of this process, dealing with material forms, has been studied by science However, without paying much attention to the involuted and secret consciousness found within. Furthermore, the leap from each stage to the next, matter to life and mind to, super, uh, to mind to supermind, appears immense and mysterious. This shift must be transformative rather than merely incremental, but science has a poor hold on such transformations. Nine. While elements of the next stage may be found in the behaviors at previous stages, the contrast between life, say, and matter remains profound. Neither or, nonetheless, Aurobindo argues, the idea that the humans and the world were created ready-made must be rejected. The existence of gaps in the evolutionary record is the result of the existence of transitory forms that vanished after their use was no longer required which is now actually an argument that Gregory Bateson made in his book. So it's kind of an interesting dovetailing between the two uh, writers. Um, Aurobindo shifts from science to the question of psychology to talk about the next stage of evolution, but it doesn't mean psychology in the standard sense. Instead, he's referring to, quote, the rise of consciousness to an to another principle of being, unquote. According to Aurobindo, while animals are bound by life, humans can exceed their bounds in a transformation yet to be defined. Aurobindo notes that as humans pass through successive states, the preceding states remain present. They are not abandoned. That's echoes of Gebser, I think. He then describes the process of transformation as essentially a kind of phase change, such as when, uh, this is my own physics, obviously, but such as when water boils to become a gas, 
he talks about pressure from above and a process by which one, quote, brings the lower gradation of being to a point at which the higher can man manifest itself, unquote. I see that kind of as a phase change. Twelve, for Aurobindo, life, mind, and supermind are present in the atom, but invisibly, more latently than actually present, so that the atom is absorbed into the physical behaviors and hence unaware of what it is and what it is doing. The atoms are somnambulists. In plant life, the being is also asleep, but is much closer to awakening than in matter. Indeed, life is responsive to existence, but still not mentally aware. He notes that it is as if life maintains a set of life values, something that other evolutionary entities cannot do. 13. The transition from life to mind operates on similar principles as the one from matter to life. However, mind, in addition to generating mind values and in a similar manner as life is responsive via life values, mind is self-reflexive. Animal being is aware of its own existence. And as life included, includes the preanimate, so mind is bound within pre-mental states. Humans, however, are not just aware of themselves. They are conscious or rather becoming so. And here, the, this is, I note that um, Aurobain makes a very interesting distinction between the notion of self-awareness and the notion of consciousness. He notes that humans, in addition to their awareness of self, recognize that the world has its own distinct nature. That is, the human distinguishes between the self and the cosmos, and not just is aware of the self. Uh, the first, and these are the first two elements of the integral triune, and the human also has the first inkling of the third element. This is accompanied by a process of intensification, uh, self-reflection, thinking, imagination, a sensitivity, and not just a reaction, but also mastery. So it's this idea that consciousness is linked to the triune and not just to self-awareness, which I thought was a very interesting idea. Now, Aurobindo focuses on why he calls humans the turning point. He claims that humans respond to two principles simultaneously one consisting of looking down or back, the other up and forward. This is another re reason humans are distinct from animals. We look both ways. Looking back, we, see, we seek both to enlarge the experience of other life forms and also to appreciate them more fully. This backward looking process actually enhances our sense of the progression towards spirit. Looking forwards, we enhance our awareness of the secret knowledge of the cosmos. And in this way, we pre prepare ourselves to exceed ourselves. Aurobindo also suggests that this progression happens not only at the levels of individuals, but also in the collective. 17 and 18, Aurobindo del delineates three phases of this progression, what he calls subplanes of mental being. The first is the physical mental with a focus on the practical embodied experiences. The second subplane is the life mental involving self-fulfillment, passion, and mastery over one's life. Uh, and also is the kind of person who has the strength to break with traditions. The third level is the mind plane of the mental, the thinker, scientist, writer, and dreamer. At this stage, he or she gains the ability to harmonize their world, seek balance, and stabilize conflictual situations, but cannot will their own transformation to the next stage. 21. Behind the mind played is, is the inner subliminal, subliminal mind, which is open inwards. These three stages form a progression, and as we shall see, not only for the individual, but also for the collective. 22, 
This is the most advanced state a person can achieve by will alone. To go beyond, the person must make active within the mind the spiritual principle. Aurobindo makes a dis- a- another interesting distinction between the soul and the spirit. The soul is what he calls, quote, an inner mind, unquote, which can open itself to the broader reaches of supermind, whereas spirit is the hidden principle of expansion which carries us forward. It is the combination of the two that he calls a double opening through which operates new states of evolution. This involves a, quote, breaking of lids and walls and boundaries, unquote, which will give rise to a broader integration and a divinization of one's nature. This begins the emergence of the spiritual person beyond the mental person. Hence, to advance, one needs to, quote, call down from above the forces of the spiritual mind and the higher mind and overmind, unquote. Implicit in this is the idea that progress is no longer an act of will, but requires what I call a kind of grace from the divine to live within our inner being, that is, beneath the surface of being. The spiritual individual thus enters into the triune knowledge of the secret principle within the self, the cosmic being which expands, and the divine being who draws us forward. This is the final paroxysm of the mental stage of evolution, which leads to the transmutation of ignorance into knowledge. The person must dwell here for for a time, deepening the influence of the inner being and exceed our present consciousness. If we did all this, the process of developing a new stage of consciousness could take root. 26. Finally, Aurobindo notes that if This process is carried forward by the individual without a change in the collective. The process is what he calls insecure. It cannot be completed. This, he points out, is a challenge since the collective has, quote, a great capacity for skeptical folly, an immense indolence, an enormous intellectual and spiritual timidity, and conservatism when called out of the grooves of habit. Unquote. I think that's his sense of humor showing through. <laughs> he argues that while it is not necessary for everyone to transform themselves in this way, the collective needs to recognize the ideal of such a goal and, and engage a conscious concentration towards its achievement. And 27, and finally, he then recap- recapitulates the evolutionary progression from matter to nature through a process that awakens the hidden consciousness of the world. From this, the inner being will emerge via mind, and this needs to reconnect with the outer being of the cosmos. The outer world will then gain its own inward directionality, and the inner and the outer will be united. Hence, integral consciousness becomes, quote, the basis of an entire harmonization of life through the total transformation, unification, integration of the being and the nature, unquote. It's open for discussion. There's kind of an interesting side note. The original title of this chapter was um, the ascent and its downward eye, (laughs) UIE. On page um, 109 on my version, um, he goes into the difference of um, what he sees um, Nietzsche doing with his concept of the Übermensch. So uh, Nietzsche wanted to create a Übermensch being and um, his his idea was that um, you can't do it by yourself. So you have a self, you have an ego and in order to go 
beyond that, I mean, you just can do it by yourself. You need to have some outside influence. So what, what his supermind is, is not a development of a stronger ego, but it's something that comes from outside. Uh, in a point when the ego is fully developed and going higher is for him something that um, comes from outside. So I thought it was very interesting, this criticism of, or I don't know, his position on what Nietzsche thought would be the next step of human nature, which is the development of the I. And he, for him, it's a spiritual uh, outward transformation. Um, you know, I would like to know uh, um, what he would think about like a newer development in uh, evolutionary psychology, for example. Um, you know, he goes back back in time and traces this uh, development as a kind of spiritual unfolding. And I think he would be very interested in something like evolutionary psychology, and he probably would include that in some degree, develop some position on uh, kind of this newer, newer forms of thinking that have been developed in the last 50, 60 years. So, I mean, you know, reading this, I really think so, I really w wonder what he would do with something like evolutionary biology or psychology or whatever. I think that would be very problematic for him to deal with cellular biology. I think he was very aware of, of Darwin, but Darwin didn't know anything about cellular biology. Well, it could be two sides of one process. So the one being the physical and the other being kind of the spiritual evolution. Right. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm thinking of like Donna Haraway and uh, a lot of feminist scholars who are, in, who are into the life sciences and they're talking about collective intelligences and, sim and symbiotic relationships and how, um, you know, we couldn't survive without um, bacteria in our gut, which is not human. It's, you know, it's a different uh, species but uh, we, we coexist and depend upon one another entirely. So I, I don't know that that's the exceptionalism that runs throughout this book, human exceptionalism. It's very strong that we're sort of the, the top of the, the, uh, the triangle. I think he would be very challenged by a lot of the current biological um, views that are, you know, quite controversial right now. Um, and with, uh, you know, people talking about animal rights and ecology and what, what, what kind of ecology, ecological practices would support, uh, you know, species um, working together and how necessary it is for our flourishing that that happen. I think that sort of... Um, I don't think he deals directly with that. I think, I think he would. I think he would have to complexify his theory to to deal with these trends. I may be wrong. I mean, maybe it would. I, I'm not saying I'm not. I, I tend towards anthropomorphism, and um, seeing humans as exceptional for sure. Um, but I also think that's softened quite a bit by the postmodern turn. Um, and uh, sensitivity to other cultures. And I think Banerjee said this as well, that uh, he thought um, the whole idea of um, working with um, totalitizing unities um, is, is problematic and how the postmodern has wanted to preserve, um, you know, those kinds of um, pluralities and how, um, I think he's. I think he's working at the edge of that. Um, but I, I sense there's a. I think that he, 
that if each ego learns how to surrender in that unique way that that ego knows how to surrender and evolve, that there would be enough novelty and innovation happening that would, would add to um, enormous, which would add to the creativity of our uh, working and living together with the, and with other species. So uh, that would, um, you know, sort of bypass that tendency towards totalitarianism, which, which is such a strong force in our institutional life. So anyway, I'm just throwing that out there. I, I don't know what other, how other people respond to that question, but it's, it's a very good one. Thank you. I did feel that the, um, so the discussion about science, obviously I have a Patsy, well, I was Patsy Pri, what's the, what's the word? Um, a, 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 a personal investment, I guess, or something in, in that area. So um, I, I thought he was overly dismissive of uh, sciences. I'm just, obviously science has evolved since his day. So there's recent, more recent work on the transformation of matter into life, which is not um, as mysterious as he makes it out. However, the transformation of life to mind is still as mysterious as he makes out. So <laughs> he's, he's half right. <laughs> and obviously that's maybe the most relevant, you know, the most interesting transformation uh, that's not well understood at all. So. You know, I think uh, Schopenhauer, he had the same conception of the development of the world as a whole. He thought, um, you know, the world and life and humans emerged out of some kind of unconscious, you know, he was also into Eastern, Eastern thinking, some unconscious, um, I don't know, whole or whatever, but they emerged out of an unconscious drive into a more conscious was very similar similar to Aldo Bindo, I think here. But I think in Aldo Bindo, um, you know, comparing him to um, biologists, um, there's something that biologists, evolutionary biologists miss out uh, in the higher cultural realm that he um, um, unpacks much greater here than, um, um, than they, were, they would do. He goes much further with, with the um, developments or with the um, unfolding of human consciousness. And that's not, that's not in uh, biology or anywhere else. Well, I mean, my um, my sense of this of Aurobindo's view of reality is that it's um, it's hierarchical, uh, and each level is is distinct. It's a new emergent, uh, but in a way, it's 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 predestined. It's latent in the original evol evolution. But you have matter, life, mind, spirit, and then you have manifestation as such the cosmos as such including all of that and then you have this third order this third aspect the the divine source and so when it, when i he describes or when he um describes the limitations of or what he put what he what he asserts are the limitations of science or of, um one or another um kind of knowledge I think that it's because well, it's because of this because he he uh, he allows for these completely other domains of um, of knowing uh, that are not taken into account by you know by the others. So I think we could expand and complexify and enrich on any of those domains. So we could look at you know, material sciences or physics and it's uh, spend lifetimes just 
ex exploring all all that there is to to know to discover about matter uh, same for life same for mind and even more so uh, for mind because mind in this evolutionary scheme includes it sort of takes into itself or in includes in this um like Whitehead would call it a, a prehension, but I, th I think, but it's uh, Wilbur would call it a transcendent include, but it's it doesn't exist by itself. There isn't mind without life, without without matter. So this is the largest possible, I think, um, architecture for being uh, and reality and uh, truth. You know that. Um, that I've come across, <laughs> I um, but I think also that 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 he's attempting to offer. Uh, so, um, again, it's like more orderly than uh, I think is we would now understand it to be, because like John, you're saying these different domains are not so distinct. The individual is not distinct from the um, uh, you know the, his or her gut bacteria. Uh, and of course, all of those are inclusive of the material uh, dimensions, atoms, and the quantum, and, uh, and so forth. And I, I think a more, a less formalistic description would take you inside of that, and sh and would make you feel more of the the the, the um, entanglements and the paradoxes and the, the the kind of complex loops that exist between these different. Um, you know, these different levels in the, in the architecture. Um, but you get the whole architecture here. That's what's so amazing about it. Uh, and, and, what, and, and what you don't get in a, in, a, in a science, you get it in a metaphysics. You get it in th th this grand ontology. Um, and so what, what, I, what I feel that, you know, he sees as, the, uh, as a possibility is that as consciousness evolves and as it becomes more integral in the sense of including the, the multiple levels and the multiple aspects of those levels within its conception of um, you know, what is real and you know, worthy of attention, worthy of development, that, that, it, that would have an effect on how matter is organized, how life is, is expressed, how um, science is, is done. Uh, it would have an effect on everything. Uh, and, and so this idea of the ascent in this chapter, the ascent and the integration, um, it, it, it's very elegant uh, because it, it doesn't leave anything behind. It, it, it takes it up and he says expands its field. So life by itself is not as expansive. It's not as rich. It's not as, um, as divine as life plus mind and life plus mind is not as expansive and it, does, it hasn't as expressed its full potentiality as much as life plus mind plus soul or plus spirit um, uh, it, I think that there's there what comes to mind is, and I don't know who said this, it may have been Whitehead, it may have been somebody else, but it may have been Nietzsche, actually. Um, the, but the idea that there are basically two kinds of philosophers, and one are the sort of open-ended, open, you know, philosophers, and the other are the systemic, or system makers. Uh, I think Aurobindo is on the system maker side, so you get a complete, you can call it a system, a complete system, a complete whole Nietzsche's on the open side, I think, and um, Gebser, we talked about this as well, Jeffrey. I think Gebser's more on the open side because these mutations occur that as far as in, in Gebser, they, they lead to this, this integral emergent, but he's not presuming to know what that completely means. And in, in this text, we're told very clearly what it means. Um, and I like that, and at the same time, I resist it a little bit because uh, I, I want the universe to be more unknown. Uh, and 
uh, and so it's, you know to to come across a, a perspective or meta perspective that knows everything uh, knows how it all ends uh, and where it all goes um, is uh, is impressive and it's deeply affecting and it's um, uh, I think that the the after effects of this whole reading experience, this whole journey that we're, we're on, are going. I, I don't know what they're going to be, but my sense is that we're creating like a huge wave in the field. And this is sort of like the initiation point for a wave that will ripple out uh, through time in ways that we can't predict. And so, it's an incredible experience, um, and it's daunting at the same time because of just the hugeness of what Aurobindo is sort of asking us to to um, take on. Yes, it is very daunting. Um, I, I wanted to respond also to um, your, your quotations, Jeffrey, you quoted, um, I, I can't find the passage, but he's looking at direction, up, forward, down, backward. Um, when Savitri calls out, she calls to the above to come down to where she is. And she's listening to a voice from above. And I think there's something in the, the, the literature that interests me uh, about the vesicular system. I had, ver I had about a vertigo a few years ago and it returned after about a month ago, no, about three months ago, but it went away. Um, but I, I had a, an exquisite experience of the vesis, vestibular system um, going through a phase shift. So I, the room, everything spins, um, and you could move your head in a certain direction, and it would stop spinning. Um, but I had to learn how to uh, re orient myself and um, retrain my out of kilter vestibular system. And I think this is one of the, the vestibular system is, as I understand it, like the first system that really starts to come online in, in, in the, as the embryo starts to differentiate, it has to know where to go. And so you have to have an up, down, left, right, front, back. You have to have an orientation space so that the liver cell knows where to go, the heart cell knows where to go, the neuron needs, knows where to go. So what's, what does an organism need to orient itself in the space? Well, it needs a, the relationship to gravity and it needs an, and a sensitivity to light. And it seems like all, all creatures on this planet have gone through this. Um, and it's, it's really fascinating. I think his uh, awareness of up, forward, down, backward, um, the left-hand path, the right-hand path, the calling from above, the voice to come down, and his whole, his whole uh, the organization of the, of the psychic system, you know, from the chakra system, from the, the vital system, the heart, the throat, the cognitive system. I think this um, this can, I believe, this is this is this is very unconscious. We're not aware of this the way it's set up until there's a breakdown or something goes wrong. Is or usually a trauma or near death experience or certain meditative practices. Um, and I believe he mentions the dangers of the breakdown. Uh, sometimes these, uh, you know, these these rigidified sort of structures need to be shaken up so that some sort of new life can emerge. And that's fraught with peril, as we know from people who've had spiritual emergencies uh, or they've taken too much drugs. Up, they don't know where up, down, left, right are. And that is a, a very perilous situation to be in. <clears throat> um, and I think that a lot of spiritual practices actually deconstruct this embedded, embodied, up, down, left, right orientation. And um, maybe that's why we're, we're so drawn to 
you know, exploring these different meditation practices or trance work or dance or, you know, some art form because it, uh, what did Rimbaud say? It deranges our senses. <clears throat> and it's very, uh, we like these exotic and uh, complex states, body mind. And they teach us something. So I think this, this deconstruction process is fraught with peril. But if you can reconstruct, that I believe leads to some kind of useful transformation and a movement out of the sort of habitual um, conformist patterns that we get locked into in, in the in this institutions, the groups that, um, you know, demand that we behave in certain preordained ways. So I think he was aware of this in himself. And I think he, he was aware of the, of the dangers. And, um, but it, and, but the necessity of dealing with that. So I, I think we should go on to Marcos, but I know that I noticed that Doug, that you wanted to speak a little bit earlier. So I'd kind of like to give you the, opportunity before we move on to Marco's uh, section. Yeah, maybe just a quick comment on the open and the closed philosophers. Um, I, I think it harkens back to some conversations we've had about providing the structure in the massive field in order that we can explore that, that field better. I think you touched on that too, Marco, when you said that. But, so in a way, he, he's, he's both. He, he integrates the philosophers as well in a certain sense, or the philosophical attitudes there. Um, that's about all I wanted to say. But, so for me, Aurobindo provides that massive structure. Of course, a lot of it is the what if, or it, it's, it might be pure experience for him, but at the same time, he, he's a human too. He, he broke his leg or twisted his ankle or whatever might have happened. So he, um, there's, there's quite a bit of speculation here or placing terms onto the unknown. Um, but it's, it's quite the structure. And I'm, I'm ready to, yeah, as we all notice, we're, we're all exploring. So I guess let's move on. I think having a way to think it all together to think life together as a whole process is extremely useful, um, even though maybe there are gaps or whatever. Um, you get something out of um, understanding the whole of a process, I think. It's great information as we <laughs> flock together. <laughs> I also wanted to acknowledge Lauren's presence. We never said hi when she joined us, but uh, uh, sh you should have an opportunity to speak too if you if you want to. <laughs> hi, sorry to come in late. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Shoot. Can you hear me? Sorry, I came in late, you guys. I've just been enjoying the conversation since I got in. <laughs> How's everything going? Um, good. It was a little bit of a stressful day today, trying to get to sleep and I'm not. But other than that, um, I'm good. And like I said, just enjoying hearing what you guys are saying. I'm Sorry, I don't have anything to contribute right now. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Marco? Yes, so this is not going to be as a granular a summary as um, was Jeffrey paragraph by paragraph, or, although I did go through it and break down the main idea in each paragraph, and I may have a word. On, on those, but I don't think they're all as salient. They're not all equally salient. Um, so I'll give more emphasis to some than to others. But uh, this is chapter 19, and the title of it is Out of the Sevenfold Ignorance Towards the Sevenfold Knowledge. This is um, the second time 
in the book that we're encountering the sevenfold ignorance and, and knowledge. Uh, the, the previous time was a couple of chapters ago. I think we covered it last week. Um, and I had it bookmarked just a second ago. Oh, here it is. Uh, the chapter on reality and the integral knowledge. Um, I'll list them just for review. There's the original ignorance, the practical ignorance, the cosmic ignorance, the egoistic ignorance, the temporal ignorance, the psychological ignorance, and the constitutional ignorance. And then for each of those forms of ignorance, there are corresponding forms of knowledge, and you take them all together and you get integral uh, knowledge. And we can go through them specifically, but I don't think that they are the... Um, the main substance of this chapter, uh, because he's already introduced them. And what he's doing here is revisiting them from the point of view of uh, the, the, the purpose of evolution and his conception of what evolution is about. So the answer to that question, what is evolution all about, is it's about, it's about consciousness becoming a becoming realized, uh, consciousness becoming transparent to itself or aware or real to itself or, or um, manifest to itself through all of the forms, um, through the distinct layers of the grand architecture uh, of being. And I think that this point is, it's so radically different. I've, I've said this before. It's so radically different than our typical, than our starting point, our cultural starting point. We don't believe culturally, Western, American, etc., that consciousness is the center. Consciousness is the beginning and the end. Consciousness, of course, being one aspect or expression of this divine reality that he just talks about as such a Dananda, the absolute. It's God centric, right? It's it's that's what's at, that's the beginning. That's the end. And, um, you know, in this way that is, we see in other uh, systems or traditions of thought, the, the number seven comes up again. Uh, this, uh, um, you know, of course, goes back to um, in the origins of, of, of religious thought. But um, as recently as uh, Arthur Young uh, you recall, we, we did a session on Arthur Young in the Cosmos Cafe, and he has seven... Uh, levels or gradations to his um, evolutionary uh, architecture. And so what is happening is that uh, evolution is, is, is consciousness um, become heightening. So going from uh, this, the orientation, the lower, the inconscient, the material, to a higher plane or manifestation or expression. That's the first aspect of this um, emergent process. The other aspect is a, a widening. So as a new level or layer is manifest, uh, it, um, it discovers all of its potentials through, a, ma through, a, through a, a lateral, we could say, manifestation. And then the third term is the inclusion. There's an integration of what has emerged prior uh, in this in the sequence. Wilbur Ken Wilbur talks about this as transcend and include. Uh, in this in Aurobindo's expression here, there's there's a transcending, there's uh, including, and there's also a widening. And then I, Wilbur in, d would talk about that as translation on the same level, transformation going to another level. Um, but what is of note, which I think Tony you referred to earlier, uh, is that there's a necessity to go in order, basically. You can't just have mind by itself without life prior to it and uh, matter prior, prior to that. Uh, so each builds on the next kind of in a almost geological uh, kind of kind of way and so 
and, and and through the process, as I was, you know, also referred to earlier, the potentials of each level or layer are are, um, are realized, and greater potentials are realized as higher emergence um, uh, evolve. He has an interesting section on mind and the mental. He refers, he makes a distinction between, I think, what Gebser would call the efficient mental and the deficient mental. He sees in the ancient Greeks this, um, this kind of perfection of the mental emergent, the mental form of consciousness. Uh, and he sees in the modern world uh, a, a kind of sick, ill, uh, he doesn't use the word deficient, but he calls it disordered uh, and um, uh, kind of n- a narrow uh, version of, of, of the mental. I want to bring, I want to find that page here. Yeah, an imposing increase of a certain kind of knowledge and deficiency was the, the first, he's now talking about the modern age, the first result, the most recent outcome has been a perilous spiritual ill health and a vast disorder. The next paragraph, paragraph begins, for the mind itself is not enough, even in its largest play of intelligence, creates only a qualified half-light. And so we have to go, this is where we find ourselves now in the, the vast kind of catastrophe of the mental and we have the way out is through and beyond it's to the spiritual and so um in the subsequent chapters uh excuse me uh paragraphs um he talks about consciousness awakening from the psychological ignorance the psychological ignorance excuse me first was the constitutional ignorance uh, which is about what we think we are. What, what are we made of? Uh, are we made of matter? Are we made of something else? Uh, so to believe in his view that we're merely made of matter is a form of ignorance. Um, psychological ignorance, uh, and that has to do with where, our conscious, where we believe our conscious experience takes place. Uh, the ignorance is if we think it's only in the waking state, only in this kind of narrow band of, of experience and not also in these other aspects or dimensions of, of consciousness, including the subliminal, subconscient, intraconscient, the circumconscient. And I think these are just ways of orienting in a sort of interior space. Um. And that would include what, say, you know, Wilbur would call the subtle realms. Um, the dream realms is included there. Uh, interesting section on the temporal ignorance, because this has to do with when we I- identify or regard ourselves as happening. We see it as in this, we culturally, you know, in the ignorant kind of framework, see it as happening in, in a lifetime from birth to death. And he posits two different kinds of time. One, excuse me, one is not a kind of time. One is an eternity, an immortality in eternity, so beyond beyond time, a timeless immortality. And the other kind is a a continuity or duration through all time. So beyond time and within time, transcendent or transcendental and imminent. That's the knowledge. The ignorance is to think it's just your lifetime or just even just time, but not timelessness. Timelessness, but not time. The integral knowledge is including time and timelessness and one's existence through all time and beyond time. Um, the next ignorance is the egoistic. And I'm giving my kind of interpretations, like my um, what I how I understand these. But that... He doesn't use this term. I think in the developmental psychology, we 
call this sense of self? Who do you regard as you? And is it this, you know, personality with a name and a biography and, and um, you know, various life stories and narratives? Or does it have these other dimensions? Ultimately, the sense of self that he sees as true is the psychic being. It's the, the, um, the universal self it ha who has individuality, has uniqueness, but also has, and more importantly, has an awareness of who he really is, which is the, the, says the Purusha or consciousness, consciousness itself. Ig the next ignorance, the cosmic. And um, I don't totally get this one. I, I think it, 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 my understanding of it, I don't just want to repeat the, his words, the text, but is the vastness. It has more to do with space. What's the space, the sense of space that you have? And the ultimate sense of space is the cosmic sense of space because it's all inclusive. It includes all phenomena, everything that happens in exterior and interior being and becoming. It's manifest. It's phenomenal. Um, two more ignorances. He doesn't... The, the, um, the sixth is the practical. And this one's interesting because it has to do with... I would say, education and learning. He doesn't use those terms, but it means that we don't know what to do. We find ourselves awake in a world as conscious beings, but we don't know how to get to God. We don't know how to fully awaken the consciousness that is latent in our uh, lived experience. And so we have to learn that, and that's what the, um, the, the, the life journey is, is about. And that practical knowledge emerges through the evolutionary process. The last ignorance is uh, the, um, I guess the most important one, I, he describes it as that, and that's the original ignorance because that's the ignorance of what is ultimately real. Uh, that's the ignorance of one's true self, true nature, and so forth, and that is the Satchitananda or the absolute. Kind of, you get that, the other ones will work themselves out it's uh, I think what he's saying and um, and so you know, we all, we go through this conscious spiritual evolution uh, we go from all these four forms of ignorance to forms of knowledge and he sees this he sees our human experience now in history now as transitional this is going this this goes to another way of another way of being that is not confused about uh, or um, unaware of or not giving attention to the uh, realities of who, what we are, um, how we exist as consciousness, when we exist, uh, where we exist, uh, how to live, and uh, what's really real. And so, um, This, the, the, the point of this all is to intensify, magnify, amplify, uh, and manifest the, the full uh, consciousness, conscious being that we are. That, that's, I think, this is my summary of this chapter. Should make an app for that, like this sevenfold knowledge app. Kind of go from ignorance to knowledge in each of these. <laughs> Chart your progression through. I'm the one thing, probably because Wilbur came to mind. We're going to make an app like the, Intercl the ILP app. <laughs> I think that was a great summary of all three chapters, uh, I feel. Uh... <laughs> <laughs>
you did the compression job that I <laughs> missed out on. <laughs> I like both your styles. <laughs> They're great. Yeah, you did a great job too, Jeffrey, but wonderful, Marco. Well, I just wonder if we actually all, like, if we are, like, what if that, I mean, we, we can read this as philosophy, but we could also read it as a program. Like, you know, like, this is what basically you have to do. This is your curriculum. Uh, for for you know being and becoming, and in, in that sense, that that's part of what's so daunting is that well, if you take this seriously, then you really would come to, I believe, experience yourself uh, as you know in all these ways that he describes. Like we wouldn't be bound to our ignorant versions of experience, or they would arise within. You know, we would also have access to, like I'm remembering John's uh, uh, sort of circle, like uh, spatial circles of, uh, of um, phenomena, you know, that are accessible in, in one context, not accessible in another, but there could be a, a wider um, experience that includes them. So um, that's not the actuality of my experience on a day-to-day -day basis, but I, but it's not not either I mean, because it's just mixed. It's, it's a lot more mixed, I'd say. And almost what he's describing here is a purification. It's like a, so. Cause, um, uh, he, in this, this eye looking down that you, you know, he talks about, you were talking about Matthew uh, in terms of the title of the, of that second chapter. The ascent and its downward eye. It's downward eye. And the downward eye, he talks at some point, um, which I probably didn't quite bring out, but it's, it's looking back on the subconscious and, uh, and uh, I was, um, I was very sensitive to John's arguments about, you know, the different states of being that are accessible outside of our normal modes of thinking and understanding and what Aurobindo was saying about needing to be from a position, you know, higher up in his approach in order to even see those things. Uh, so I thought that was a very interesting um, and relevant context to this, the other discussions that we have uh, on, on this side. The other comment I was going to make, to, just a quick one, is to show about this open versus closed um, idea. One of the things that I feel strongly motivated to do is to go back and read Whitehead, because Whitehead has a lot to say about God. But most people who read Whitehead put the God stuff to one side and say, well, we really don't understand what he was getting at with that, and just focus on the rest of Whitehead's discussion. But White has a whole section on God. Um, and you would, I, I now sort of feel a stronger motivation to go back and look at that because it's a somewhat different, you know, it's obviously a different approach from Aurobindo's, but it is interesting in relation to Aurobindo to do that, I think. So. Well, you know, Eric Weiss wrote a lot on Aurobindo mm -hmm. and on Whitehead. And he has a, a short volume, um, Bifurcation, the concept of nature, Whitehead. It's a, a short volume. Maybe we should yeah. do a study group on a, on a short work by Whitehead because it's so dense. But I think the concept of nature would be interesting because he talks about this bifurcation that's happened between mind and nature. Mm. And I, I believe this also fits in with Bateson's project of how to uh, coordinate nature and mind. Um, so I think that's a, an interesting possible future project. There's also a uh, recording 
of concept of nature. So you can oh, really? hear, um, I can't remember his Whitehead. I think it's Whitehead himself doing the reading. So um, you, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting way because it's, it's actually a very accessible book of Whitehead's. And I, it, I've not read it's it lovely yet. lovely from the reading, yeah. I've read other of his books and um, it can be very, very difficult. But sometimes it's not that hard. I think uh, Science in the Modern World, I read, it's fairly easy. Yeah. Yeah, it's process and reality that's a really hard one. Yeah, that's a very hard one. <laughs> We're coming up to the top of the hour. I have to, say, I have to ask Matthew where you are. <laughs> I'm in Munich. I'm sitting on the balcony of an Airbnb. And if I turn the light on, it'll disturb people. So, <laughs> okay. yeah. I thought you were down a mine or something. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I just had one thought come up that I wanted to share. Um, as uh, about like the ignorance that Marco was talking about, and. Um, let's see if I can get my ideas, my words together. Um, the, the thought is that, you know, we, we feel like un inundated by this ignorance. Like it's, for some reason it appears like it's hard. It's like this really hard work that it takes to get to a, a conscious place and not allow our, what I would say, like more of our like basic animal nature to control us um makes me think of a video that i was watching and they were saying how um like fear is something that we learn that it's not we're not actually born with fear um so in, in a sense like we're already born in bliss and then we like learn how to be in the world through you know, example on our parents. Um, but there's this like, oh, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, let's see. Our true state is that conscious bliss. Um, but our minds are like programmed to think for like only the moment and what matters right now like these experiments with people where they're like if i give you a hundred bucks now would you take that or if i give you 150 dollars in two weeks would you take that and overwhelmingly people will choose the hundred dollars now they don't they're not even concerned about two two weeks from now is too long you know even though they're getting another 50 bucks out of it um so that it's just this like we're so overwhelmed by that instinctual nature, the like lower brain, you know, that, it, um, that I think that causes us to get caught in the ignorance a lot. And it's not our true nature. Like it's part of us, but we allow it to become the, the master, you know, when like, like the ego ignorance and things like that, we like allow that to control our reality. And it really is, work like this and talking about thing, ideas like this and what Arabindo says to, to get us to step back out of that and, and see that like our consciousness, our spirit is like the, the master or whatever and not slave to our lower brain. It's like there's as much unlearning to do as, as learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really Yeah, because cause it's like our, our lower brain and our instinctual nature, is it's essential for our survival, you know? And yet we also live in a different reality today. We're not, like, struggling to survive out in the wild. Um, so I think we have an opportunity now, especially to really move beyond our 
and only transcend and include because <laughs> we need it, but yeah, it needs I us. <laughs> I agree. As the lower brain takes us back to the brown video that we saw about the virtual world. So all of these uh, apps that we use have these reward mechanisms built in. And that's what they're speaking to. You're speaking to your lower brain. They're saying, I'll give you this right now if you stay on for a few more minutes. <laughs> so, that, so that's what would be cool about uh, you know, a sevenfold knowledge app. It, it would be that it would ha actually help you Disp you know, dispense with the ignorance it would actually <laughs> this is just a hypothetical you know, but I, <clears throat> that should be possible I but i think we're absolutely these meetups are extremely subversive we're using the technology in ways that it's not designed to sit for this amount of people for two hours to discuss this gigantic tone <laughs> um, this is like using the technology I think in a in a very innovative way. So, I I think we're being anarchic here. I mean, I feel that way, <laughs> but I think it actually this could become a trend. I think we would be living in a very different kind of social world than we are now, with our app driven, you know, broken up attention spans. But I think it's really neat that our we can heal our our fragmented attention spans if we want to make that part of a program you know it's not that hard like study a book together have a two-hour conversation once a week see what happens next i feel a lot better afterwards i feel a lot like a lot of mental hygiene has been taken care of for several days i'll feel myself in a slightly pleasantly euphoric state i think it's just simply because i i use my mind in a way that uh, was inherently uh healthy for so, congratulations, everybody. I think yeah. we're doing a good All job. Right. <laughs> so, next week, uh, I think there's just one chapter. Um, sorry that I. So you, other people have to look at these schedules because um, I didn't mean to schedule three chapters in one week. Um, it was about 60 pages and it sort of worked out, but. Um, Anyway, I, th I think a little bit less could be more, but next week is just the chapter on rebirth, the philosophy of rebirth, and I think that I'm that I'm assigned to that one uh, again. So um, I'll 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 be back. <laughs> Did I miss something? I have a line uh, for philosophy of rebirth with the order of the worlds. Maybe I did something wrong. You know that what? Was, my... That's Sorry. my understanding too. Sorry. <laughs> oh, really? I, I may have made a mistake then. Did anybody take on Order of the Worlds then? You did. Take on? <laughs> uh, oh, I, I mean to, to, uh, you know, to offer a summary. I could oh. do both. Mm -hmm. No mm -hmm. worries. But if somebody wanted to do the other one, uh, we could do that as well. So we, we can kind of trickle, trickle down each time because um, I'll be doing the next after next week, so I, I don't mind jumping in to do the order of the world, you said? Yeah. Okay. I'll take care of that. <laughs> okay, well, let's see everybody next week. Mm-hmm. It, it was a lovely discussion today, though. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Very much so. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> see you next week, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night. Cheers. Bye. Bye.